اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله generally in muslim speeches we begin with a declaration of faith that there is only one god and that muhammad is his messenger and servant and after that i'd like to say distinguished members of the panel and friends brothers and sisters ladies and gentlemen from different communities who are here including uh, our friends from overseas from pakistan and holland and suriname that i feel it a great privilege that uh, i can address you about the history of <clears throat> the walking muslim mission and uh, go through some events which uh, took place over the years over the decades in that mission so since the head of our organization has already covered the history of the working muslim mission as such i thought i'd place my presentation of that point by point history towards the end and show you the more interesting part of my presentation so that you're already still awake when i reach the more tedious part that's uh, <clears throat> one of the advantages so the coverage of events which took place at the walking mosque uh, during the time that the walking muslim mission operated this is from 100 years ago till the mid 1960s the very that very coverage indicates that this was the national center of islam in the uk during those years and the imam of the mosque was considered as the head of the muslim community of britain and at official events uh, he had the same protocol and status as the heads of the christian churches now there was a news organization known as british pathe which used to film current events and then they produce a news reel compilation which would be shown in cinemas before the main film began and that was uh, the only way before television of seeing uh, visual news with the films and, and movement and since they released their archives or made them available uh, on their website we discovered that uh, they filmed more than a dozen occasions at the walking mosque between 1914 and 1958 and all of those film clips can be viewed on their website although they are in low resolution not high quality uh, they can be purchased from british pathe in a higher quality to broadcast them at a meeting such as this one one has to pay a fee to british pathe which we have done and the bbc and itv also filmed some events a few events at the walking mosque in the 1950s and 1960s so here we'll show five of those film clips and we've done some research into the background of the events presented in those film clips since those news reel clips only bear the date and there's not much further information so i'll present them in the reverse order of time so that we go backwards since the later ones have a sound commentary as well as you go to the earlier ones you'll see that they are uh, entirely silent so the first event we'll uh, look at is Eid al-Fitr on the 3rd of June 1954 which was reported uh, if we cross correlate with the, the Islamic Review magazine 
It was reported in the Islamic Review in August 1954 that more than 1,500 visitors came and Muslims represented all nationalities and they were ambassadors and diplomats from uh, a number of Muslim countries who by then, of course, were uh, independent. And as we go back, we'll see that uh, that relates to a time when Muslim countries weren't independent. And the Imam was uh, Dr. Uh, S.M. Abdullah. So... The Shah Jahan Mosque at Woking in Surrey becomes the meeting place for about a thousand Muslims. They gather here each year at this time to celebrate the end of Ramadan. This is a fasting period which lasts for 30 days. During this time, they may not eat or drink between sunrise and sunset. Now the guests enter a marquee in the mosque's grounds, having first removed their shoes, for a service. This is held at the marquee because of the large congregation. Indians, Pakistanis, Africans and Egyptians all bow to Mecca, the great holy city of Islam. The Imam, Dr. S.M. Abdullah, conducts the service half in Arabic and half in English. There are about 60,000 Muslims living in this country, but only a fraction were able to take part in the pilgrimage to the mosque at Wokin. The traditional embrace brings the service to an end. Rice and curry prepared during the previous night is served. This simple Eastern dish is the first meal the pilgrims have eaten during the daytime for a month. In the heart of Surrey, thousands of miles from their own land, Muslims obey the laws of their ancient faith. So from there we move back to December 1936. And this is again Eid al-Fitr, reported in an issue of the Islamic Review that 500 people came. Of course the number of people increased with time, so it's decreasing as we go back. And there were English converts to Islam and Muslims from various countries. And again ambassadors and diplomats based in London. And the Imam was uh, Molnaf Tabudin Ahmed. And here I'd like to point out that uh, his son, the Honorable Nasser Ahmed Saab, is sitting there. And uh, he was born in Woking at the time when his father was Imam here. So there is Mr. Nasser Ahmed. I know it gives you an idea about the year of his birth, but I won't reveal the exact year. So, the report, admittedly it is in the Islamic Review, but the report says that it is quite accurate, that with the exception of Mecca, nowhere but at the walking mosque is there presented the opportunity of seeing as many different nationalities assembled and united by the soul bond of Islam. You see, in those days, the, in our times, there are Muslim international conferences all over the world, Muslims visit other Muslim countries. So you can see Muslims of different nationalities gathered together in one place. Uh, in the early centuries of Islam, you could only see that at the pilgrimage to Mecca, when there were Muslims from different nationalities gathered together. And after that, the first place where you saw such a gathering of Muslims from a variety of countries all over the world was the Woking Mosque. And therefore, people did describe uh, Woking as being uh, the Mecca in the West. So Few of us have the chance of going out east of seeing at first hand the ceremonial of the Muslim feasts and hearing the call to prayer. But at the Shah Jahan Mohammedan Mosque at Woking, Eastern ritual comes to the West. <laughs> If you look, 
is looking round. Allahu Akbar. That child there. Allahu Akbar. You can see the press photographs in the back. One of the first royal engagements of the new reign is when the extension of University College Hospital is... I deliberately kept that part in to set the news really in context. The second news item was about uh, the new king, uh, George VI, opening a wing of uh, University College uh, Hospital. So as we go further back, then there's April 1933. This is the other Eid, the Eid al-Azha, where the reports of the gathering was large and Muslims of all nationalities again comprised the congregation. And near the end of the clip, you can hear a, a passing train from the railway line which goes uh, along at the bottom of the grounds of the mosque. And I'll point out where you can see Lord Headley in the front row. And the Imam was one uh, Maulana Abdul Majid. There's no commentary with this, but it's the sounds of prayer. Now. Muslim guests uh, along the back with the, the ladies in uh, particular. And the fourth one is um, the lady ruler of the Indian state of Bhopal visited the walking mosque. Uh, during British rule in India, there were certain princely states, as they were called in India, which had internal autonomy and they were ruled by Maharajas. Uh, most of these were Hindu states, some were Muslim states, and Bhopal was the second largest Muslim state. And uh, it had, uh, for a while, uh, women rulers succeeding one another. And one of those rulers visited the working mosque in 1925, and she was the one, her name was Sultan Jihan, and she was daughter and successor of that Shah Jahan Begum who had funded the construction of the walking mosque by providing money to Dr. Leitner. So you will uh, see her here and uh, also in the film clip uh, you will see Lord Headley and Khwaja Kamaluddin ushering her into the mosque. And, uh, you'll see that she's wearing the full veil, uh, about which I'll say something uh, after the film clip. So a welcome address was presented by Lord Headley, in which he said, 
we see in your highness a perfect example of the true Muslim lady. But besides that, we welcome in the person of your highness one who is second to none among men in wisdom, in culture, and administrative ability. So here he is complimenting a Muslim lady ruler who is second to none among men. One recently departed in this country whose uh, funeral was uh, held and broadcast might also by many be described as second to none among men, at least in wisdom and administrative ability. So, and in her reply she said that even in the 20th century there are people in Europe who entered in absolutely incorrect ideas about the teachings of Islam. They regard it as a militant creed which cannot be adopted to the requirements of modern civilization. They suppose it to be inimical to all progress. Your society claims to have undertaken the task of correcting these misconceptions and educating the British public in the right interpretation of Islam. I wish you every success in your noble work. In conclusion, I congratulate Khaja Kamaluddin the trustees of the mosque and the members of the society on the noble work they are doing. And uh, I think I've said this already. The first person you see in the foreground is, his name was Mr. Lovegrove. He was quite a well-known tailor and he became a Muslim and took the name Habibullah Lovegrove. His family have a website called lovegrove.co.uk and uh, they've exchanged some information with us about uh, Mr. Lovegrove. So, here we are. This is completely silent. She was 67 at the time. There's Mr. Lovegrove with the top hat and morning suit. You can see which is Khwaja Kumaladin and which is Lord Hadley there. He's showing her around. Khwaja Kumaladin misses a step there, as you can see. You can see the English ladies there. So there's Lord Hadley again. Someone calling out the Azan. Now here from a book written by a former High Commissioner of Pakistan to the United Kingdom, uh, Sher Yar M. Khan, who is from this Bhopal family. I've taken these two photographs or perhaps sketches of both Shah Jahan, who funded the building of the walking mosque, she's on the left, and the lady you've just seen fully veiled, Sultan Jahan, and this book uh, by Mr. Shah Yar Khan tells us that uh, in 1928, Sultan Jahan Begum discarded the burqa, that veil she was wearing, at the age of 70. She reasoned that she had to set the example for Muslim women in order to carry forward the torch of education and emancipation. So, if it's not too unjust of me to point out, I will say that uh, things seem to be more advanced 90 years ago than perhaps they are now. I don't know whether in any mosque in this country today, a Muslim woman ruler from a Muslim country would be ushered in, in this uh, way with uh, men res respectfully showing her in. And then that uh, Begum of Bhopal, the daughter, realizing that uh, for progress of women in India, 
that uh, she, as an example, she gave up the full face veil. She also actually abdicated uh, the year after uh, you see in the film. And uh, so her son then uh, succeeded her. Uh, by the way, after the Indian independence, since we were now in modern times and princely states really couldn't continue, so the Indian government uh, established elected state governments in all those uh, uh, states. And so the Maharajas uh, lost all their rule and uh, their palaces, as you know, became tourist uh, accommodation, which is what they are now. And lastly, we have the visit of what's called the Indian Khilafat or Caliphate delegation in March 1920. Following the defeat of the Ottoman Empire in the First World War, this delegation of Indian Muslims, prominent Indian Muslims, came to see Prime Minister Lloyd George on behalf of Muslims of India to present the case for preserving the Turkish Caliphate because the Caliph was regarded as a sort of symbolically as a temporal or worldly successor to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. That's what many Muslims in India felt. Turkey had just been defeated, and there was a question of what would happen after that. Of course, we know then that uh, the modern Republic of Turkey emerged about three or four years after this, and they themselves abolished uh, the caliphate, the T Turkish caliphate. But uh, since Muslims in a country like India were under British rule, so they felt that this a caliph of the Ottoman Empire was sort of a symbol of a Muslim power and rule in the world, particularly since his rule extended over what's now called Saudi Arabia. And so he was regarded as the custodian of the Muslim holy places. And yeah, so this is that uh, delegation which was led by one Muhammad Ali Johar, who was a nationalist leader in India and also a journalist and orator. And he's a household name in the Indian subcontinent. And this meeting was reported in the Islamic Review as well with further details. And uh, also there are details of what happened when he presented his case to Lord George, who then uh, dismissed his case. And uh, if I may say so, most problems of the present day Middle East can be traced back to that post-World War I settlement uh, which created all these countries that you hear about now, like Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, etc., and then later on, of course, the State of Israel. So uh, that's what the report says. There were three members of this delegation, and among the English Muslims or British Muslims converts present there was one whose name is given in those years as Professor H.M. Leon. But in fact, it was the same person as one W.H. Abdullah Quilliam, who has increasingly, increasingly become well known now uh, for uh, establishing a Muslim community in, which operated in Liverpool from the 1890s to the year 1908. He had visited Morocco and embraced Islam. And so when he came back here, uh, either, I forget which, either the King of Morocco or the uh, Ottoman Sultan declared him to be the head of Muslims in UK. And then under a, a cloud, he was a solicitor and a scholar of languages, but under some sort of a cloud, uh, he left this country in 1908. It had something to do with the, something infringing some rule of the law society. But he returned back to this country when the Walking Muslim Mission was established and then appeared under his name of uh, Professor H.M. Leon and wrote many articles as well. So let's just uh, take a look. The Imam who was shown in here, Mona Sadruddin, many of us have actually seen him uh, personally in later years, obviously. So there's Mr. Muhammad Ali Johar. You can see his oratorial style. 
Of course, people didn't actually move jerkily like this, as I used to think. This is only because the camera is slow. You can see Mawlana Sadruddin there wearing a, there he is in, with the turban. So that's uh, quite brief as well. Uh, in uh, 1957, the Aga Khan of the time, the third Aga Khan died, and a memorial service was held at the walking mosque. And you can view it on the website of uh, ITN. What I'd also like to point out is uh, the book, the booklet mentioned by Mr. Jonathan Lord. Uh, copies of which you've got, uh, I see, in front of you. Uh, I compiled this uh, recently for this occasion, and there's a history, there's an overview of the history of the mission and information, biographical information about Khwaja Kamaluddin and Lord Headley. And then there are several photographs largely taken from uh, the Islamic Review magazine, and they range from 1915 to the 1960s. Uh, there were three or four postcards associated with the walking uh, mission. You know the kind of postcard when you go to some shop and uh, the postcards, they would local uh, monuments, etc., on them. Uh, I've actually got uh, three or four such uh, postcards there. Uh, these two I've illustrated here. Strangely, although dating from 1905, uh, they are in color. And how I got hold of them, though, of them was that I bought them on eBay for 50 pence each. But they are worth a lot more uh, to us. And the top one also has a that actually, if you read the message, it's the only one which is filled in with a message. It was, seems to have been sent by a girl from walking back to her home in Wales. And it just says, dear mother, could you send me some more money? I'll tell you later how I managed to spend all that you've given me already. That's all it says. So things don't change very much. And the last postcard is from 1961, when there was a philatelic uh, uh, event held in Woking. And it's not only just a postcard with Woking Mask uh, photo on it, but uh, all posts sent out from Woking that day, the franking stamp bore uh, an image uh, of the mask. So I have a copy of that card, should uh, people wish to see it. I think some of the important events, there are several, but I would like to mention just two. One is Maulana Asam Tufel, whose daughter is here, Ruhi Tufel. And uh, there was a big meeting where Dalai Lama was also there, and different uh, representatives from different religions were there. That's a very important event where the Imam of the Shah Jahan Mosque booking, Maulana Asam Tufel, participated. And he has already mentioned about uh, Aga Khan's memorial service. And uh, there is one, Haile Selassie, when I think he was forced to leave Ethiopia. So he made it a point to come and visit the Shah Jahan Mosque. It's the film is there, I think, because of the shortage of time, uh, docs have been shown. And Haile Selassie requested the Imam to pray for him. And the Imam said, unfortunately, it was my father who prayed and he said, I feel that you will be reinstated, and he was reinstated. Mm -hmm. So there are so many important things which Dr. Sab has compiled. There is a short of time. We are just skipping through and hope you will read this booklet, which is not only beautifully <laughs> illustrated, but beautifully uh, compiled as well. Just to add, uh, Haile Selassie was uh, on the run in this country after uh, Italy uh, invaded uh, his country. Uh, Libya was also an Italian colony. But they extended uh, in the 1930s their rule over uh, uh, Haile Selassie's country. 
So he then was effectively in exile here. And lastly, it's mentioned in this booklet, but uh, since 2005, we've been developing a, a website whose address is uh, just walkingmuslim.org, where there's uh, uh, much more uh, documentary detail and uh, scans of certain original documents and translations of uh, Urdu reports and uh, a much more extensive photographic library uh, than it's possible, obviously, to give in this booklet. And also, we have almost the entire archive there of the Islamic Review from 1913 to around 1970. And we are... Uh, frequently contacted by researchers, broadcasters, academics, where they ask for further information about some event, or more likely they ask permission to use some photograph or uh, some material. And uh, you may have uh, seen this series, Great British Railway Journeys, presented by Michael Portillo. Uh, in one episode, or one part, which unfortunately I missed, uh, he was going to cover uh, the train journey which passes the walking mosque. So they contacted us and uh, uh, said that they'd copied some of the history from our website and then they wanted me to check that what they'd copied was, was, was accurate. So they cleared it uh, uh, with us. And also since last year for the first time there's a uh, a valuable book. It used to be mentioned when I was at school. It's the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. And of course these days it's online rather than published in volumes. And uh, last year, since last September for the first time, they've added an entry about uh, Khwaja Kamaluddin, which is written by uh, a university professor uh, in London. But they asked us to, uh, well, we offered to read through it to, to check for accuracy. So I'll uh, finish at that point, and uh, I hope that uh, what I covered has, be, has added to your knowledge. Certainly preparing for it uh, added to my knowledge, and I thank you very much for uh, listening and viewing patiently.